Hello and welcome to the Smart Attack Podcast. I'm here with Matt Maruka from Raw Optics and a lot more. Uh, Matt, how are you today? I'm doing well, Nick. How are you? I'm great. And it was uh, so nice to meet you and meet some of your team members, some of your friends also and colleagues uh, when we uh, finally re-met um, each other in person in London a few weeks ago. It was very lovely. We had the great dinner at a Thai place and it was just, I mean, it made me very excited for this conversation because you hinted at some things you've been working on. And for people who may, might uh, not have actually listened to your episode because it's so far away, it's episode 15. And now we're uh, number 83 here on the Smart Attack podcast. Episode 15 was three years ago in July, July 15th of 2020. And we did talk about circadian rhythms, light, blue blockers, but I want to revisit a lot of these ideas and also um, some of the work that you've been doing specifically with uh, Dr. Alexander, Alexander uh, Wunsch, uh, and that's very, very uh, interesting because he's one of the pioneers in this very, I'd say, small field of those in the world that actually understand photobiology. Um, but first, I want to start with this because I came across this article in the New York Times. I I used to be, I guess, neutral towards the New York Times. But in the last years, I saw a lot of things that I really consider crazy being posted as, you know, as opinions in New York Times or sometimes just standard reporting. And this article is, of course, a, more like an opinion piece. That, and the title is this, How to Get Absolutely No Sun This Summer. And the, this article was posted last month. And it goes wow. and, and says, um, there's the, the site, an assistant professor of dermatology at New York University Langone Health. And she says, Dr. Marissa uh, Chrissy Chrisito, I guess. Is there such such a thing as a safe tan? She says no. It's is is stand up paddle boarding worth the risks of sun exposure? No, said I. That's what she says. And people reacted on social media. I was like, oh my god. So how how can we reconcile this statement from a dermatologist against everything we heard, especially in the last three years, towards sun exposure, vitamin D, and circadian, um, the importance of the circadian rhythm that is just coming together in research. How do you react to at something like that in 2023 being posted in mainstream news? Like, no, absolutely no sun this summer. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. I'm so glad you brought this to my attention because I actually just looked up the article and it's going to make uh, really good food for a fodder for, let's say, memes and sort of education <laughs> for those yeah. who are willing to see things with a critical and uh, open-minded eye. So I would say there's really no way uh, to reconcile what this dermatologist is saying. And, and what I mean by that is that if he, it would be like asking, is there a way for us to reconcile what the scientists studying, you know, the, the advancements of 5G technology are saying about the health risks of 5G? In other words, there is a fundamental conflict of interests because their entire industry is built upon the idea, the flawed idea, that the sun is bad. And so when I started to understand light and how it affects our health, I, I pretty quickly realized that what I had believed as a kid, which was that I should cover up and I should wear sunscreen, and I was mm -hmm. even that, that odd kid who would actually encourage my friends to wear sunscreen – um, at the time when I was like 10 years old, a very ironic now, right? But uh, I had to realize that I was wrong and that the things that I believed, many of the things, in fact, most of the things I believe, not just about light and how it affects health, but, you know, as you know, most of the things that we're told are not true, like that, you know, for example, or things were just not told at all, at least growing up for me, we never heard about you know, glyphosate and Roundup Ready wheat and all the wheat being toxic or vaccines being full of mercury as an adjuvant being toxic. Like we just didn't hear about that kind of stuff. Uh, no, nobody told us about that. Mm -hmm. So and then EMF, nobody told me that that could be a risk for my health. Yeah. And so, you know, I just had all this like, what? Well, they didn't tell me about this. They didn't tell me about this. So at a certain point, nothing was really surprising. And I think actually when I got to light, I wasn't really surprised anymore. I was like, okay, 
So you're telling me the sun's actually good for us? Shocker. Like it's evolutionary biology. I studied the paleo diet for years and applied it. Okay, well, the sun's the natural form of light. Of course, it's good for us comparing with artificial light. And of course, it makes sense that artificial light and the distorted spectrum of artificial light can be disruptive. But I don't expect anybody to just believe what I'm saying on face value and take take my word for it. I'd actually want people to go in and do the research and look at all of the evidence that blue light in particular controls our circadian rhythm and that it's essential to set our, our rhythm, the production of neurotransmitters and hormones in our brain every single day. This stimulus is critical for our for the health of our biology. So, so anyway, to the question about the dermatologist, I really do not believe there's a way to reconcile this in reality other than to understand that, again, the dermatology industry is built on a false premise, which is that the sun is bad for life and that you should avoid it. Now, uh, I could add that one of the most sort of surprising things that I've taken away from my work with Dr. Alexander Wunsch, who's one of the top experts in the world, as you mentioned, in this field. Uh, in, in fact, he's, I would say, the top expert in this field in the world in photobiology. There aren't many, to be honest. Many of the people who are studying this have now passed away. It hasn't been picked up by many. Yeah. So I'm glad as a company and as an organization focused on education and creating really great high quality products, we can actually help move this information forward. But all that's to say, one of the things he's, he's influenced me with is actually the idea and the understanding that you can get too much sun. Whereas some of the people who I'm sure you're familiar with, who I studied from years yeah. ago, really intelligent people, but had more of a mindset of like, take as much sun as you can, you can't overdose. And I also think that that can be dangerous because Alexander Wunsch, when I asked him, you know, do you think the sun can cause skin cancer? He almost laughed and he said, of course. And I was like, what? Because some okay. of the people I've been following are like, no, 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 no. And anyway, you know, breaking it down, of course, there's many more factors when we actually dive into that statement, right? There's all the toxins we're exposed to that could sort of predispose ourselves to yeah. cancer season, right? And in, in the sun, you could argue, could even just be like a trigger because of the, the energy and the ultraviolet light in the sun. But so all that's to say, it's not that there's zero logic behind what they're saying in this article and this idea in general. If you overdose on the sun, like anything, it can be harmful. But at a fundamental level, light is the energy responsible for life on Earth. It's the primary energy source for life on Earth, the sun, right? And so to just at a, at a basic level, to claim that the light of the sun is toxic or harmful for us in particular is just really baseless. <laughs> Bacteria... When they're exposed to light, especially ultraviolet, they die instantaneously. And that's why, you know, you, you never see mold growing in the sun. Mold always grows in the places that are dark and damp and dim and they don't get yeah. any. So bacteria are a different story. But eukaryotic life, in particular, our like clade, let's say, the, the ones that came onto land, we evolved cell membranes to take in light. We evolved pigments like melanin to absorb light and also protect us. We have these really amazing structures in ourselves called mitochondria that, of course, you're very familiar with because they're affected by EMF in a negative way, non-native EMFs in a negative way. Sure. But sunlight is the EMF that the mitochondria evolved with that enhances their function. And so then when we take all this non-native EMF, whether it's blue light from a screen or Wi-Fi or whatever, that disrupts its function. So anyway... That's really the, the base of this uh, is that we, we should understand that sunlight's critical for our health, that it's the foundation of life on Earth, and that there's tons of modern scientific evidence. There's many studies in the last decades actually showing how important the sun is for cellular health. Yeah, so it's it's so many things. The the more I look into it, the more I learn. And, and some of the stuff I, I learned, you know, more than 10 years ago, uh, part of it through Jack Cruz, but also other people. It's in the quantum health movement. Also, sometimes on Facebook groups and kind of, you know, frontier science uh, aficionados that were just sharing things left and right that, that left me very shocked at the time. I remember when I, I discovered... Even just the idea of a circadian rhythm was brand new for me a few years ago. I mean, a decade ago, it was like, wait a minute, are you, you're telling me that looking at my phone during the night causes a sort of 
jet lag, a sort of mismatch between the light environment and my position on, on the globe. And I remember being blown away listening to podcasts being like, wait a minute, it means that everyone is is affected because we, we use all this artificial light. And it led me naturally to connecting with your company among others and starting to wear blue blockers at night because I think it's a, a, a logical step. But I do have questions about blue blockers because I keep seeing even uh, doctors and uh, neuroscientists such as Dr. Andrew Huberman said they're not sure 100% if blue blockers, you know, uh, provide benefits. As far as my experience goes, massive difference. Most people I talk to who use the blue blockers regularly and use them in a way that, you know, well, when it gets dark at night, you have the blue blockers on, you keep them on, and, you know, you're serious about it. Uh, all of them tell me they see a difference. So, the anecdotal data is very strong in my mind, but as far as the scientific studies, I don't know if it's being studied, if it's even a, a popular topic among scientists. What does the uh, Hamblin and, and other researchers in, in light, such as Alexander Wunsch, are, are they doing like large trials around blue blockers? Or is this something where the science is not evolving, so in the meantime, people are kind of you know, doing their thing, and if they feel the benefits, so be it. Uh, do, what have you seen in the last years as far as science around blue blockers go? Thank you so much for asking. So it's a really great question. It deserves a really good answer. Um, so when I got into this, so people have the background, there was even less science about the mechanisms, but there was a lot of science as at a foundation still about the mechanism. So what I mean by that is that the, this, the science around light, blue light and circadian rhythms has been very solid for the last 15, 20 years since the discovery of melanopsin and then more research into circadian rhythms. And it's only really grown. The Israelis have done lots of studies on, or a good, I should say there are a few studies in particular out of Israel on the negative impacts of artificial light at night. Some really, really good data found there that artificial light at night causes all sorts of chronic health issues on a population level. So there's some really good evidence already around the risks of artificial light and the, and the mechanisms of how blue light, that component of artificial light, is disrupting our health. So it sort of was like a, a no-brainer, let's say, for people to say, well, artificial light causes a problem on a population level. And then we know from a mechanistic standpoint, at the mechanism level, at the cellular level and in the brain, blue light is this wavelength that melanopsin in our eyes in our retina actually absorbs and it doesn't communicate with the visual centers. We have photoreceptors that are non-visual in our eye. So meaning that the eye isn't just for seeing, but the eye actually wires to the part of the brain called the hypothalamus, specifically the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is considered the master timekeeper of the body. And there's actually this connection from our eyes to this timekeeper that sets the timekeeping of our entire body. And this is known. And it's known that blue light set this, and this has been known for years, and it's only being confirmed more and more and more as the research evolves. And Huberman's now talking about this constantly, right? So we yeah. know that that is, is well-established, and it's been well-established for some time. So when I learned about this, the recommendation that I was getting from some of the different people I was following uh, was wear blue light protection eyewear. So wear these lenses, especially at night, to protect your sleep from the disruption, particularly to protect your melatonin secretion from the disruption of artificial light. And mm -hmm. it just made sense to me because the mechanisms were really clear in the science. Now, as far as actual studies on blue blocking glasses, there are some, not many, not a ton, but the issue is we have to distinguish. There are two types of blue light blocking glasses. One are clear lenses that don't block the wavelengths emitted by LEDs and screens, but they're still sold as blue light glasses. So eventually... Maybe someone will sue them for these false claims. I'm not interested in going down that route. It just doesn't make sense for us. It's just whatever, just help people, give them a better product. But someone may file a lawsuit, and I wouldn't be surprised at some point if that were to happen, or it'll just become very publicly exposed, which, again, we're not interested in degrading anybody, but we'll continue to educate about why clear lens blue blocking glasses don't work because they don't block the right wavelengths of light in the, the range that's emitted. They literally block blue light that's emitted by the sun, but in the range of wavelengths that's shorter than what's emitted by LEDs and screen devices. So anyway, there are studies on these clear lens blue light blocking glasses, and 
sort of expectedly, they show very little results. And so then people could say, oh, well, blue blockers don't work. Well, it's like, yeah, you used blue blockers that don't work. So you think that they don't work. That That's a natural conclusion. But in the studies on amber lens blue blocking glasses, there are some positive results actually in some small studies. I mean, the, the, the groups are not massive thousands of people. They might be a few dozen participants in these studies, right? So it's still very early, but we will do some research over the coming years. I would say even as a company, I have some contacts, people who are interested in studying these things who, you know, we'll just supply the glasses and then they can test independently. So yeah. it's not biased by us, right? But anyway, so um, anyway, that being said, now, I knew when I started using these among the people who who were using them in the community that I was in this niche, let's say you called it quantum health. It's a kind of the descriptor that was used, it still is used, and people saw results, and I felt results when I wore them. It's hard not to when you put on a yellow or even orange or even red lens, there's so much less light overall, and in particular, the short wavelengths that stimulate this circadian system, so you get tired. So I knew they were working for me. I felt it, right? Could it be a placebo? Sure, it could be a placebo. But anyway, now here's where we get to the really good stuff. So we started, uh, as, as we grew, more and more people were using our glasses, and we would always test our lenses to make sure they're blocking the right wavelengths. That's the key thing, right? So the key, the key metric, let's say. And then we had a partnership last summer with Aura, the maker of the Aura sleep tracking ring, because yeah. they knew from enough, again, there's, a, there's enough science and enough people using these and feeling benefits that they thought, well, you know what, let's offer something to our members, like a referral program, refer a friend uh, to buy an aura ring with this, this link and they'll, your friend will get a discount. And then as a thank you, if your friend makes a purchase, we'll give you a free pair of raw optics. So it was a really great incentive for aura members last year. And, and, you know, we may do something similar again in the future. Uh, Anyway, so we had many, many, many thousands of people get our glasses just as a gift. And so a lot of these people were even skeptical. Not only they weren't like some were open minded, of course, because they heard about it. And for them, they were just excited. But some were truly skeptical, but they did it anyway, because it was free, right? Like, who cares? So let me just try it. And so these are skeptical people. So they're taking out a lot of the placebo effect, let's say, uh, you know, they're reducing that uh, factor that could skew the data to some extent. And we got voluntarily hundreds of people sending us reviews uh, as a result of their experience, very, very positive results on their sleep, dozens of which actually specifically shared uh, points. For example, their deep sleep increased significantly immediately. Uh, people whose heart rate variability increased yep. immediately just from using the glasses. Like, and when I say immediately, I mean sometimes the first night, sometimes within three days. We had people who said, I... Li- um, like paraphrasing, but pretty closely, somebody said, I saw all this hype about how these glasses could make you sleep better even on your first night. And I literally couldn't believe it, but I wanted to try them just to see if there was anything behind it. And the guy said, I tried them and I literally had the best sleep in many, many years the first yeah. night. He may have even said my entire life. And then he said, believe the hype, they live up to it. And we had people, we had women who are actually, uh, one woman in particular is a Canadian physician who is really active in helping people with autism kind of find a community and find acceptance and get their a proper diagnosis and so on. And basically, um, she had written it, this very thorough review, shared all this, and it's a public review, which is why I can share this, you know. And um, But she even shared screenshots of her sleep data before and after. She said, you can see from these screenshots, uh, irrespective of what I tried, sleep was typically a concern for me as it is for people on the autistic spectrum. So it sounded like she implied that she's on the autism spectrum as even as a physician. And she said, uh, basically, I looked back on my life and I saw once I had used these, I realized that my sleep got worse and I thought it was aging or menopause, but it was actually that I had increased my blue light exposure in the evenings over that period. And it wasn't aging or menopause at all. And I can finally sleep again. And it was that simple with our wow. sun's lenses and so these are the daylight lenses the yellow ones the sunset lenses are more red orange i have them right here just for anybody watching the video okay. you can but anyhow so and these are more the sunset lenses are a little bit let's say stronger for sleep because they don't just block blue light they also block in the green range and they're darker as well so there's just more effect so all that's the same that yes there's already great the mechanisms are the strongest there are some studies which we want to do more of they're not really they're strong the ones that are on the uh proper amber lenses that actually block the right wavelengths of blue light 
but again, not strong enough to make like global population conclusions, let's say. But then all the anecdotal evidence and the fact that we've had over 50,000 people purchase our glasses and, and many, many, many of which really love them and get uh, amazing results. And then there's other companies too uh, out there, you know, Viva Rays, Bond Charge, um, Swanwick and True Dark, you know, all these other filter optics, this one that I just met in London that just started. They're also sort of niche because they're making colored lens blue blocking glasses. Like the majority of what's sold are these clear lenses that don't really do anything. And they're sold as screen glasses, right? They're not generally focused on sleep. Those don't really work, but that's the majority of what's going out. So there's still, I would say it's probably less than 10% of the overall global market of blue light glasses are the actual colored lenses that actually have an impact. Oh, okay. But the, the interest is, is it maybe even less than 5%. Honestly, it's hard to know exactly. Because now anytime anybody gets a pair of glasses, their optician says to them, hey, do you want to add the blue light coating? Yeah. And so charge them all this money, but it doesn't actually block any of the right wavelengths from screens. It, it's a huge ripoff. And they'll charge $100, $200 for that. So anyway... Uh, I think the evidence, if you look at it holistically, is very positive for blue blocking glasses. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, I mean, it, it's an investment for some people, especially if you get prescriptions. In my case, that that's what I, I had to do for both of my peers. I've got the, just uh, out of full transparency, and these are like Bond Charge, uh, the yellow ones, uh, the, yeah. the, the dark ones, uh, the dark red that I use are raw optics. So I use all of them. In reality, I'll have to update both probably because my prescription usually gets better year after year. I try to heal my myopia a little bit and it's been stable. Hey for maybe four years now just trying to and, and part of it is getting off screens getting outside having natural light in my eyes throughout the day so just that and my ophthalmologist was like i don't know what you do but keep doing it you know the, the classic professional that that's kind of i don't understand who this guy is and he's doing all these these biohacks but i did fail i i, I want to spend maybe five minutes on this because i i need to clarify this for myself and then i know my my audience will like it as well so if i got the uv filters or blue light filters on these uh i don't remember if i did but i probably did and i probably paid 120 dollars for this why is it a ripoff or a, a useless coating in your opinion and how i guess they claim to be blocking something and and in your, yeah. your my understanding of what you said is this is not the right type of wavelength in i guess part of uv and part of blue that we should be blocking in the first place with clear glasses so they're basically they have no purpose whatsoever what's your yeah your opinion it's a great question so basically when you have so you know obviously about electromagnetic fields and all of this so this is a lot of familiarity for you here sure so basically and, and probably for your audience i would assume so basically the visible light spectrum goes from round about 380 400 nanometers up to around 720 to 760 something like that right As some people can arguably see the edges of the spectrum more than others but once you get deep into 800 and the near infrared, you can't we can't really visibly perceive that. And below 380, and you get into ultraviolet, we can't really visibly perceive that unless someone has a certain condition that maybe allows them to. Anyway, so the blue wavelength. So when you, let's start with this: when you have a clear lens or a clear substance or translucent substance like a window or a lens, basically what it means is that what's coming in from the one side is being transmitted through the other. And that's what translucent means. It means, well, trans means across in Latin and lux is light. So letting light through basically is what translucent means. Now, so the clear lens is letting all of the light through. Otherwise, it wouldn't appear clear. It would appear modified in its color. What I mean by that is if you take out the blue that we perceive as blue, inevitably it can't appear clear anymore because part of what made it so again, clear would be that you, you, you could remove the substance and it would still look the same, like what you're looking at would still look the same, right? But if you remove visible blue light in the visible range, it cannot look the same because you've taken out wavelengths that inevitably shape the color of what you're looking at. Sure. Therefore, when you, add, when you remove blue light, the resultant colors combine to generally make it look yellowish. The lens appears uh, the, the more blue you remove, the more deep yellow, like the lenses I'm currently wearing, 
yep. the more yellow it looks. And if you remove all the blue, it almost looks orange. And this has something to do with, you know, the way the colors combine. So, for example, if you have red, orange, yellow, and green, and you combine them together, you get a sort of yellowish color, at least from the transmission of light perspective. Now, the clear lenses with the, it's called in the industry, it's called a UV 420 coating. So what does that mean? It means it blocks UV light and up to 420 nanometers. It blocks virtually 100% of the light. And so this is the ultraviolet range and then going up to the blue range. Now... The issue is that the blue light, the, the up below 420 nanometers, is only emitted by the sun. It's not emitted by modern light sources, with the exception of fluorescent. Fluorescent lamps sometimes have an emissions peak, a, a spike, below 420 nanometers. So you could potentially get some protection fl- from a fluorescent light from a UV 420 coating. But it's not relevant anymore because 90 five plus percent of lights now are led in fact it's probably even higher fluorescents are all going out the window they're all being replaced with leds cold cold white or warm white leds as well as all screens are not all but virtually all screens are led based yes so so basically that being said now the blue light spike is centered at 455 nanometers plus or minus 20 meaning it's always centered around 450 455 because that's the classic blue led technology but the, the, the actual spike, it's not just a single wavelength. It's a broad, like a triangle. So it goes down. It has an emission down to around 430, even 425, and up to, let's say, around 470, 480, right, depending on how, how wide that spectrum is. Now, what that means is if you're wearing a clear lens blue light glasses with the UV 420 protection up to 420, you're, you're blocking blue light that might come from the sun. But if you're indoors on a screen, that blue light isn't even really relevant the thing that that they're marketing these to protect from are screens but they don't block any of the wavelengths that come from screens so i have a video on youtube people can look up called clear lens blue light glasses exposed and i made it a few years ago and i literally bought like i probably spent a thousand bucks and bought all of the top clear lens blue blocking glasses brands and i went through every single one pointed the meter directly at my computer my laptop screen measured the spectrum, put the lens in front, and it basically changed it at, uh, it didn't change it at all. It basically changed nothing. And then you put a yellow lens, any brand, I mean, uh, it doesn't just have to be raw optics, but any brand that's yellow will still reduce the blue light to some degree. Now, the difference with us is that you might just buy one on Amazon that's yellow, but it might not block all the blue, or it might block some of it, um, for example, or it might be too dark for the day so what we do is we look at optimizing blue light protection we look at optimizing the color rendering so the actual color perception with the light that's remaining and also the hue of the lens so the actual shade of yellow essentially that we have to have the certain effect we want to have like sort of giving people some energy waking them up but also keeping them calm and balanced and these are things we're kind of right we're regularly tweaking actually and modifying not to mention that I, from my personal opinion, we have the highest quality frames. Uh, from a material standpoint, we do. No one else is using German metal and Italian acetate in their blue blocking glasses frames. So these are the highest quality materials. But we also, and this is a, a personal opinion because it's subjective, but I believe we have the most attractive styles. And many of our customers feel the same way, which is why they purchase from us and not another company. Now, for some people, they don't care. They don't want the higher quality product. They don't want the, the nicer looking style. They just want something that works. And then there might be companies that people can go to that'll have a, a cheaper product. Um, but again, you get what you pay for a lot of the time. And a lot of the time people come to us from other companies uh, that their glasses broke or you know they weren't happy. And then they're so stoked because not only are they happy they have a higher quality product, but they're actually feeling the effects more. And I think that's because we put more attention to detail than any other company I'm aware of in the testing processes. Like we working with Dr. Alexander Wunsch in particular, we're doing tests that nobody else does on their lenses. And I know that because we have to send the manufacturer custom made testing equipment that we make to make sure that the lenses block blue light at a superior level. They don't even have the equipment to test at these manufacturers overseas. So anyway, um, that's why the clear lens glasses don't work. Gotcha. And, uh, 
do they argue that maybe you block a little bit of UV? Is UV even emitted by modern screens anymore? No, or it was, no, it not was something at all. from the 80s, right? The it old could TVs? Be yeah, it could. Exactly. Yeah, from all. Yeah, exactly. But that has nothing to do with what they're marketing for. And I, I mean, seriously, Nicholas, it's crazy that wow. I have companies like in this video. It, it, it didn't the video. I'm surprised it didn't kind of blow up. I mean, maybe just because it, it's ahead of its time. But um, basically... They literally say screen glasses on the box, and it's like I'm putting it in front of a screen. It just shows you these people don't know anything about what they're doing, and sadly, they're just in it to make money. And then there's people who are paying money for those products, and the placebo effect is real. I've learned that from studying Joe Dispenza and you know working uh, with him a bit that – Basically, the placebo effect is a very, very real phenomenon. In fact, I think it's a great phenomenon because it means that we can make ourselves healthy with our mind, right? Um, and so if somebody buys a pair of clear lens blue light blocking glasses, I don't like to be the person to break it to them that the science doesn't support that product um, because they might still be getting a placebo effect. But in the, inevitably, if they're asking me, I'll tell them and you know, because they say, oh, well, why are your lenses yellow? And I'll say, listen, I mean, the science is very clear. In fact, it's not even it's it's not even like science in the sense that people think about studies and this and that. It's like you point at the sky and you say the sky is blue. Like I don't need a scientist to tell me that the sky is blue. And it's yeah. the same thing. I take a measurement with my device and show yeah. it to somebody and they're like, okay, I can see the blue light from the screen. I, I just did this with some friends of mine in Costa Rica. I just met. They both had clear lens glasses. I was like, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Boop, 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 beep. Show it in front of the screen. And it's like the blue light's still there. And then I put the yellow lens and the blue light just completely disappears. Now, to be fair, Nick, people don't a lot of the time want to have a colored lens. Yeah. But our job, you know, your job, obviously, people also don't want to have to turn off the Wi-Fi and they don't want to have to leave the major city. And sometimes there's things that are kind of inconvenient. But when you understand, let's say, the science of EMFs, non-native EMFs, you might make different decisions. So my job is kind of the same. It's like when you understand the science of light, which is what we're focused on teaching people, you understand, well... If I want to really have blue light protection, I have to wear a colored lens. And that's just it because blue is a color. It would be different, of course, if ultraviolet were a non-visible wavelength of light controlled this process of the circadian rhythm. Then you could probably block that. Un you, in fact, you definitely could block that wavelength and you wouldn't notice a change in the color. Like Because when you block ultraviolet, since we don't see it, you don't notice a change, right? But since the blue that affects these receptors in our eye, the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, big mouthful, and the melanopsin pigment inside of those, it's blue light that affects those, it's blue wavelengths. Same that the visual sensors in our eye perceive when we make images in the visual cortices in the brain, those are the same wavelengths that we see as blue. Now, the, the brain, the circadian rhythm, isn't taking that information and saying, oh, it's blue light. It's just certain wavelengths that stimulate that system. But again, those same wavelengths that stimulate that circadian system and the timekeeping are the same that stimulate our brain to make images that appear blue. So that's why we call it blue light. It's really just certain wavelengths, right? Um, it's not blue when it comes in to set our circadian rhythm per se, right? It's just wavelengths, um, not image forming. But again, it's the same range. And so when you take out that blue that sets this circadian system, you also sort of create a different image in the visual cortex that doesn't have blue in it and so everything looks more yellow and that's it but at night it's amazing because like it's so relaxing to walk around and when all the lights are bright even yeah. on the streets in london i remember walking around on the streets in london and being like god jesus they put in these led overhead <laughs> lamps in london that like burn through my retina i felt like it was painful oh and yeah. i had it on and i was like ah. anyway yeah yeah totally and i mean I guess the, the the good thing about all these LEDs is that even if you have your very dark lenses, you see everything, <laughs> right? In some in some environment in Europe, I prefer like Italy or even Barcelona at night. Uh, some parts of Eastern Europe are still preserved where they feel like, oh no, we should keep the street lights amber because it kind of keeps the ambience. Like it's it's more like cultural preservation and preservation of how it looks and the feeling of the city rather than oh let's be environmentally friendly right and we know it's it's a big mistake on many levels it's a huge but mistake it's, it's a, a huge mistake it's incredible i was in i was in prague i should tell you because you mentioned eastern sure. europe and prague the whole city is still orange and i was like oh my gosh yeah 
people you couldn't imagine, I mean, you could imagine, but most people couldn't imagine when you think about the physiology. So now that we're speaking about it, maybe they could imagine, but the physiology is so profound. When you have less blue light at night, your body gets in this really relaxed state. You're like, ah, oh, that's a good energy. It's calm. Like think about candlelight. Like imagine, just got to make this analogy. Like imagine making love under fluorescent white hospital lighting <laughs> versus being surrounded <laughs> by candles. Like that's the difference for our brain. Oh I'm my serious. God. That's the yeah. difference. And yeah. so you go to Prague and I'm like, I'm just like, yeah, I like this place. All of the lights in Prague, it's they're called low pressure sodium discharge lamps. The old school, they're pure yellow. They're like, if you measure them with my spectrometer, you get one very mm, singular wavelength. It's like 10 nanometers band. So you, you don't have color perception then. You only, It's monochrome. You have just that orange color. Everything's like yellow orange. But it's so beautiful, as you said. The whole city is dim and they don't have this light pollution. In fact, it's not environmentally friendly. That's the lie. It's it's yeah. not environmental because of the immediate environment, the animals migrating, the human beings in particular who were supposedly protecting the earth so that we can all survive. We're killing the animals or we're disrupting the birds' migration patterns. We're disrupting human circadian rhythms and absolutely trashing human sleep quality and health and brain function and cognition the next day because of this disruption and, and chronically it creates a real issue as the Israeli studies have shown uh, from artificial light at night on a population basis and that's really solid data. So it's not even helping the environment because at the end of the day, the amount of carbon emissions, because that's what they're all you know concerned about, is going to be way higher from all the energy that has to be invested in medical care, sick care. And at the end of the day, what's the point if you make the people you're supposed to be protecting and saving the planet for, you make them sick? Well, What's the point? Yeah, and you're still disrupting the ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, Dave Asprey has been talking about it for years. He, When he was uh, in the Vancouver Island, he had all his exterior lighting switched to red. And of course, it kind of looks like Dracula uh, mentioned out there, uh, like a vampire nest or something, if you have all your lighting red. But it's respectful of nature, and you have owls and like nocturnal animals actually thrive in that environment if you put bright leds you can uh, unfortunately you push nature away including bugs uh, that it attracts too many bugs and it causes all sorts of havoc so yeah that's just another angle that's important to mention so thanks for recognizing this and you uh, I, I still have a few questions about your your work um because you work closely with dr alexander Wunsch, and i think it's very important that I get my, my personal light. It's, it's really for me, it's a bit egoistic, but I have some questions that remain about the glasses and whether, and I know you answered this on my last podcast, but maybe you have a, a different answer now or a different understanding. Uh, the last podcast we did together, you told me that when we have glasses and there are like side, you know, the angle of the light doesn't get in through the sides that much. So therefore, glasses like these, let's say this is the blue blockers, are sufficient compared to other models that would be, you know, over the eye, that would look a little bit more like X-Men or something futuristic, which is even, even more difficult for people to adopt because it does not look like something that is trendy or something that is socially acceptable that much like having big red glasses that wrap around the eye if you're alone watching tv uh, maybe you feel okay about it and I, I would probably but i would not necessarily go out with these glasses so do the glasses that wrap around the eye and block the sides, does it really make a difference or not? And what does Dr. Vunch, if you heard his answer on the topic, what does he think about that? Yeah, so actually, I can't speak for Alexander, because Dr. Alexander Vunch, because I haven't spoken with him specifically about this subject. Okay. However, um, I can give you, so I'll give you my best understanding, and I'm actually going to ask him, and I'll get back to you about that. That'd be awesome. You know, and then we could throw it in the show notes, or we can, you know, yeah. tell, we'll get another podcast down the road. In fact, I could set you guys up, because to interview him would be like, a, with me, maybe it's it's sort of a great, more maybe relatable conversation for people. I think with him, it'll be very relatable too, but he can take people into a world that they didn't even know existed. I mean, I, again, I, I can maybe just show them it. But it's amazing when you have a scientist who's been in that field. I mean, you know, you know the difference. It's like somebody can speak with you and get a really deep knowledge of EMFs and especially the things that are relevant. 
But then if they go talk with Dr. Andrew Marino, it's like he's going to just take them to a whole sure. different so that his experience can only can only do. Yeah. So anyhow, that being said, uh, there's solid evidence that the these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that are the the ones that communicate with the hypothalamus and set our circadian rhythm are located in the inner retina, particular in the lower portion. The reason for this, which which makes sense, is that from a light stimulus perspective from our environment, the main light stimulus is the sun, which is always at horizon level or above, and generally it's up, right? And so when you want to know it's daytime, the light's generally going to be coming down from above. And so that's where those sensitive cells should be to receive that signal. Now, the reason that matters is because for vision, for general vision, you know, you want to see everything down, up, around. So the, the visual centers are, you know, more, much more evenly distributed throughout the eyes. But I should say the visual photoreceptor cells. But for this particular non-visual mechanism, these cells are more concentrated in the lower inner retina. What does that mean? Light from below, you could potentially argue, I, I don't believe, I don't think it's been studied from my, um, you know, my understanding of the research or my knowledge of the research. I haven't seen anything on this, but again, it could exist and I could have missed it. But that being said, I wouldn't be surprised if light from below actually has much less effect, even blue light, on the circadian rhythm because if it doesn't strike those cells, it's not going to have as strong of an effect. Hmm. Now, but that means on the opposite hand, and it's a great question that you ask, light from above actually could have a much stronger effect. And so overhead lighting at night, even if you fill your house with red light bulbs, it's sort of a disruptive stick signal to have overhead lighting. So when we're, he and I are working together to reinvent lighting as a whole concept completely and the way we think about lighting and the way we interact with lighting. And that's one consideration I can share, just drop that here um, without getting into too much detail. But for example, maybe the best lighting shouldn't be overhead. Maybe it should be somewhere else, right? Um, not necessarily on the ground, but you know, for example, there's, there's just, these are things we consider. So now that's to say that what I do often is I'll actually wear a baseball hat when I go out at night because yeah, like what we, we could also add like flaps or kind of, you know, <laughs> something on top of our lenses. But at the end of the day, and you know, this, of course, like we do have to make things practical for people. And so I, I believe, um, based on, again, the research that exists, the mechanisms, uh, my own experience and the experience of our customers, and especially all these people now measuring it from Aura, et cetera, with the Whoop, whatever sleep tracking device they have and seeing these results, that what we're doing is, to, to put a percentage as hard, right? It's like 90 to 95% effective compared to all these additional minor improvements we can make. Again, when you talk about peripheral light, so that peripheral light generally, unless it's from above, isn't striking that uh, inner retina, that area. And so that's why it wouldn't be a huge issue if you don't have big wraparound glasses. That's And also, last thing, we're mostly looking forward. Like it's rare that anybody looks like that off to yeah. the side unless yeah. you're trying to look at somebody without them knowing that you're looking at them, which isn't very often. I mean, depending on who you are, of course. <laughs> but um, But basically... So that also means that the majority, like if I just look through my glasses right now, I would say approximately 90% of my visual information coming in is within the, the sphere of the lens. It's probably yeah. more. There's very little that's outside, above or on the sides. Hence, um, this is, a, but also we are, we do kind of generally lean toward having bigger frames, you know, bigger frame styles or wider frame styles to give people that extra protection because what okay. I will say, separate from the the melatonin suppression effect, it's sometimes just annoying if you have one portion of your visual plane in orange or red and then like a little bit that's coming in that's bright. It's just disruptive just from a okay. pure experience yeah. standpoint. So that is even more of the reason to me to have more peripheral coverage just so that you have consistent color. You don't just get this immediate spike of like white light when everything else is orange. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a. I I think that's a good argument for it. I I haven't seen any research about the wraparound models versus. So it's still you know, one could argue oh they're better they're not better. Well, I mean we would have to to have more scientific studies kind of comparing the two models in order to really identify is it worth it. In the end, as far as 
my my understanding is people with regular blue blockers that do not wrap around the eye get the results uh, i i hear those results i see it in myself if i use the raw optics at night they do not wrap around and yet i do feel a big difference in my i would say in my fatigue levels that just go sky high when i put the glasses on so again it, that and that's something i mentioned in in past interviews but um it, when whenever i talk about circadian disruption guys if you want to have a great evening with your wife and it's 10 p.m and you know you want to have wine and relax and talk don't necessarily put the red lenses on because for me it would it would be like okay good night like i'll, I'll fall asleep in front of her like it's it really so if you want to go out with friends i i would also like advise if you have strong effects from the blue blockers i used to make that mistake i went with friends and i know it's going to be a late night and i put the blue blockers and then i feel sleepy and i feel why am i here so in, in situations like these actually avoid them but in other situations it's weekdays and i want to go to bed early i put them even earlier and now i'm like i'm 9 9 15 i'm like okay let's cut this series short because i'm just i'm i'm drowsy right now so they're super effective for me so just a side note i'm but so yeah, glad you said that though yeah you know, i should just add that to be honest as a kid like when i was 16 17 before i had my own company and i was just wearing the ones from Amazon, like the, the safety goggle ones, which also yeah. wrapped around, uh, you know, they were like $15. They were really ugly, but they <laughs> yeah. worked. But they basically, um, they made me so tired and I'll be with my friends and they'd all be like punching me on the arms. Like, <laughs> wake up, bro. We're trying to go have fun. I'm like, nah, dude, I got to protect my circadian rhythm, bro. Yeah. It was so funny. Like, and I was like the crazy 17, 16 year old who was wearing the glasses, my friend. And I remember sitting there like, guys, sorry, I got to go to sleep. Like, I'm out. Have a good night. Yeah, which is okay. Again, I I just felt like maybe I overdid it and I did not. I kind of use the tool. It's as if you're you're taking like I don't know a supplement to go to sleep or like chamomile tea. Like if I take chamomile tea, I'm like I don't know if I'm a lightweight or something. I am lightweight, but still it has a strong effect on me. So if I want to have fun past 10 p.m. and have a good time with friends and kind of have a late dinner no chamomile tea for Nick or else he's like, I'm, I'm out of the conversation. I don't understand what's going on. I'm like, no, I'm just dreaming about my pillow right now. So just a side note, like use those blue blockers. Like when you feel like, okay, well, it's time to go to bed early because for a lot of people, including myself, they're very powerful. So anyway, just to go back to the, the, the side glasses, I guess, maybe if in the future we have good studies i would consider maybe adding like adding a pair like these and maybe even i mean raw optics would move uh and and actually do a pair like these if like massive science comes out and they're actually like 50 percent better but i would maybe wear them a few days per per in the, during the week week nights when i feel like i'm not going out and i know i want to knock myself down but for the moment i don't really see a strong argument for them although i have some colleagues that uh were trying to argue in their work and i don't know where that comes from i, I have to ask them but they said oh no you definitely need the side covers and i still to this day do not understand where that comes from exactly so maybe it's more like of a, a personal opinion so anyhow i want to be respectful of your time. And then I want I'm to good. know where is Raw Optics going? Uh, I know you have uh, new projects going on, some of which you, you, you told us about in confidence. I'll let you reveal whatever can be revealed. Uh, but at the same time, publicly speaking, uh, is it new models? Is it like, how can you continue to reinvent the, the wheel of blue blockers? And you mentioned lighting. So is there future projects that we can expect from raw optics where it's more than just blue blockers or do you have side projects i'm excited because i know that everything you touch will turn into something very special because you Thank are you. officially obsessed with light just like thank i am you. with emfs i think so i'm excited to hear so what's next for matt yeah, thank you so much, Nick. So I would say that, well, first of all, the glasses, blue light protection glasses is where we started. And because the lighting of the world is the way that it is, it's where we're going to continue. Uh, and yeah, we're continuing to reinvent blue light protection as a concept in different ways. So there are some products we're working on that 
some cha- uh, additional lens types. And I don't, I couldn't give a timeline on this, whether it's six to 12 months, that's probably realistic, but some different okay. lens types for different use cases and even for some effects that people wouldn't necessarily consider that you could derive from blue light protection eyewear. So um, that's cool. And that's about all I can say for now there. But so we have some cool additional lenses coming out uh, down the road. We have uh, a focus really, and I've mentioned this on podcasts before, but basically we want to move into, in fact, we're moving into uh, more light focused work, right? So there's the light protection, but then there's actually the creation of better lighting. And this is something that we're actually working on now uh, actively just it's it's always again a process when you're creating something new but we're working on things that um, both therapeutically so lights for example like people talk about red light therapy panels and all this kind of stuff things in that domain products in that domain um, that people can use for a treatment and have changes in their physiology from you know light and different wavelengths of light and so on and then general lighting so lighting for homes and so on these are areas that definitely need attention and that we have lots of demand from our audience that we create a product because they're not satisfied with the products from other companies and i'm not personally either and so yeah we're working on these types of solutions and that that's basically it i mean at the at the end of the day as they say uh we are more interested so education is the main focus like i want to put together the highest understanding possible of this information about light and so i have a let's say personal brand focus or a person more personal focus on what i call the light diet which is a simple protocol anyone can use to improve their health using the science of light and that includes certain products we make or will make that also just includes a lot of lifestyle habits that you can't make a product of and I wouldn't want to because it's better naturally than it is something that you could create for example getting out in the sun more getting out and and taking care of your body Um, for example meditating practicing meditation to channel your energy in better and more efficient and more intentional ways so these are all things that I'm particularly personally interested in in particular meditation at the moment because I really am amazed at how powerful our mind is. I I used to be of the belief that we were environmentally controlled beings. And when I eat, so even after I went from studying food and learning about all these diets and all that and getting obsessed about all the nutrients, macronutrients and all the autoimmune paleo, all this gaps diet, all the keto carnivore, all that stuff I did. And after going from that to light, I thought I had made this breakthrough that this is the thing. This is the end of all. This is the the, the world changing subject is light from our environment. But I didn't consider and I paid the price in my own life. I didn't consider the impact of our inner light and how our mind and the way we channel our energy, which is we could call it our internal light, how that affects our life. And I was actually even after applying more sunlight to my life and more exposure to natural light and more circadian rhythm resetting with the sunrise and all the stuff and blue light protection and all my hormones and neurotransmitters I'm sure were working better than they were in previous times before I started doing all that but there were still lots of times where I felt kind of empty inside kind of unhappy mm-hmm. even and I was like well I mean I should my brain chemistry should be working so <laughs> everything should be working right but why why am I feeling sometimes this way or even a lot of the time, and this was uh, around the time going into the pandemic, and I thought, well, my model must be incomplete. I must not understand biology and life fully, and, and the people I'm following must not have it all because I'm taking their words and applying it all, and you know, there must be more. And so that's when I started to really look deeper, and I came across the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza, which is really, in, in my understanding, it's a sort of modern presentation with the science of some stuff that's been some information that's been known and shared for thousands of years even from ancient India the science of yoga the science of meditation the science of inner transformation tai chi qigong a lot of these kinds of concepts are related not necessarily the exact same but I realized oh my gosh I've been so blind like my beliefs uh, that we're just kind of subjects of our environment in a way victims if you will uh, is limiting me. And I was actually making myself like a victim to my light that I was exposed to. You know, now, to be honest, there are times where I'll walk without my blue blockers just to strengthen my mind that it's not going to kill me. Hmm. I still wear them 90, 95, 99% of the time, in fact, 
just because I know that there's science on the mechanisms and I know that I feel better and more relaxed at night when I use them. But sometimes I'm like, you know what, let me just like defer for a minute because I don't want to be in the in the belief that I'm a victim constantly to my environment or something in my environment is going to control me. Now, that's just one small example. The bigger impact of that is that, you know, you can meditate and change your reality. So all of that's to say that that's where I want to go more and more. And in addition to creating amazing products that help inspire people about their potential, about their physiology and what they can do in their life using light, I think a really great impact that I could have would be uh, personally experiencing and studying more first in this field of meditation, but ultimately from all the benefits I've already experienced in my own life, sharing that with people. So that is also where I'm really fascinated and excited to go, Nick. Thanks well, for asking. My God, I'm, I'm excited to see where you go next. I mean, I can say that uh, we met several years ago in uh, 2018, if I recall correctly. Uh, I met a young man then. Now I'm meeting a peer and a master. You're becoming a master, my friend. And, and I must say, uh, your 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 presence and your knowledge has only deepened its shows in the last three years. So uh, you're someone I look up to when it comes to sharing all about light, learning about light. And uh, for sure, if uh, you can eventually make it happen, a conversation between me and Alexander Vunch, I'm, uh, I'll be so grateful because I think that he's, uh, I saw some of his work, especially several years ago, and I was blown away. And some of it was a little bit too much for me, I guess, to try to grasp. But at the same time, it's it's these scientists that sometimes I don't I don't think they get the recognition or the public platforms that they deserve because uh, because it's it's such a, a specialization that is rare these days. So I'm glad that you're working with him, uh, even helping him kind of translate his research into actual products that can make it to the marketplace and help help people immediately uh, better their lives. And, and maybe even the blue blockers and other things you're working on can be kind of a, a, a gateway solution to a better life, like getting them realizing, oh, you know what, my sleep is poor, and then they get into other things, right? But And what yeah. you shared about, you know, this spiritual aspect or uh, really watching your thoughts, for me, it was also a journey. So I really recognize myself in what you said. It resonates deeply. And uh, at one point, I was uh, always with the EMF meter. Oh, no, I'm getting exposed. And whenever I was getting exposed, it did cause anxiety that in reality did not serve me in any way whatsoever. The, the, the fields are there anyway, right? Regardless of my opinion or how I feel about it, if I feel bad about them and, and I exaggerate my response, then not only do I have the biological response that will be there regardless to some extent, but instead of making myself stronger, I'm making myself weaker <laughs> in these fields. Amen. So Amen. It, it's it's something tricky. Um, and, and I must say, uh, just to be to to recognize that because I have many of uh, many people in my community have severe levels of el electrosensitivity, it is extremely tricky to both experience the sensitivity and the symptoms but also let it go and not aggravate your situation because of the anger you might feel towards seeing the tower seeing people with phones it is extremely tricky and when i was at my most sensitive i did not have a good handle on that so uh, yeah. if you're a sufferer then it is a long journey i'm not saying by any means that this is easy and you can switch your state like this but it does help and many people who have EHS uh, eventually are able to recover when they avoid exposures, become healthier. Some of them have blue blockers. Of course, light, I think, is, is a un unfortunately for a lot of EHS sufferers, they tend to forget about light as a type of EMF, but I think we need to bring it back and be part of the EMF conversation for sure, but also being uh, recognizing that all this level of activism you might do can contribute, but if it's with the level of anger against what is being done to you that is overwhelming your system, uh, it is not serving you in, in any way. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I it's agree. something that if you think about it, okay, I have to work on this. I have to work on, you know, being ang angry maybe one hour per week and not like full-time job. 
which I used to even writing my book like a few years ago, like, oh, these telecoms, I saw towers. I was like, uh, my, I made my day miserable just seeing the towers and saying, oh, my God, the population is getting blasted with waves right now. Th this world is a dangerous place. And, and it might all be true, but feeling it over and over and over again, it just I mean, it, it's just a stress that in reality, I'm I'm choosing to stress myself about that uh, mm -hmm. and it's not serving the people that I want to serve with my book and this podcast and other things. So anyway, a, a long time. Brother, I have but to say you're, you're like, uh, you're also, these are very wise words and I think we're both students on the, on the road to mastery. And I think it's a, uh, it's a really great thing that you've shared because people need to know this information because like you said, we're uh, actually, we only give more of our power away to these companies by getting angry. Right. So, yeah all the great leaders in history, like Mandela, for example, they didn't give their power away in the end. And that's what made them stronger. So we have to find that really, they call it like the razor's edge. It's like that fine line that we have to walk that that is very not easy, You're right? It's not easy, even though we can change our state, I believe in an instant, but it's not easy. Uh, yeah. And definitely, I agree with you on that. And, and last, you know, one thing on this is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the United States, Thank God for him, because even if he doesn't win the presidency, I have to say, like, he is bringing so much awareness about some of the risks with, you know, you know what, the thing that everybody's been getting recently, but also about electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. He mentioned it on the Rogan podcast. Yeah. And I'm like, you, I remember actually we were at, uh, well, this was really brief, but we were in London and you said somebody has to get on Rogan to talk about this <laughs> stuff. And I agree, the information needs to get out, but he actually mentioned it, even though it was in passing and Rogan was like, what? The wife, yeah. you serious? And then they looked it up and they saw the research and they're yeah. like, oh, yeah. think about how many millions of people that brought awareness to just like that. And they listen, they believe him, they believe Rogan, they, they believe that he's he's going to research it and do the science. So yeah, time's coming, man. Time is coming. Yeah, things are evolving. So for people who want to look into your products, we do have a discount code. I have to mention it in case people want to get it. It's called the, the coupon is smarter, so like the smarter tech podcast. So smarter for 10% off. So thank you. That's amazing. 10% off. I think it's off the entire uh, order here. Yeah, so I'm going to have order. a link underneath uh, the video. And for people listening to the audio, it's in the show notes. Episode number eighty. Three, uh, Matt Maruka, thank you so much for coming. And I think uh, let's let's make it a little bit faster. Uh, your next presence on the podcast, yeah, rather uh, than waiting three years, I my think point. one will be plenty. You have so much to share. So whenever you have, you know, updates on what you're working on with Dr. Voon, you have something to share. I know it's going to be an amazing conversation. Let's have you on again and uh, share that with everyone. I'm so excited for the next time. Thank you, Nick. I would love to. Whenever we have a product to launch or something else, I really appreciate that. Um, people can find more if they want just on yeah our instagram page raw underscore optics and people can follow me on instagram the light diet and i'm po posting more and more there lately and also working on some more educational content uh you know guides course potentially maybe even a book we'll see um but that's all stuff that people i think could benefit from tremendously in addition to the products because again the information proceeds um, all the products and we'll chat about this separately, but I have a podcast that I don't really do very often because I don't, I, I'm not interested in interviewing just everybody about everything, but I want to interview experts in the field of energy, electromagnetic radiation and electromagnetic uh, energy, whether it's spiritual or scientific, that's what the light diet podcast is about. And that, again, we've only done a few episodes with a few different people like Dr. Jack Cruz and Jacob Lieberman. I would love to also interview you and dive deep into your information and we do have a pretty loyal audience uh so i think it could be great so we'll, i'll send you an email and we can connect awesome with... sounds good well thanks again yeah, matt it was uh, tremendous thanks for your presence here thank you as well take care take care